Data Skeptic is the official podcast of dataskeptic.com, bringing you stories, interviews, and mini episodes on topics in data science, machine learning, statistics, and artificial intelligence. All right, Linda, our topic for today is one shot learning. Now, I'm going to hand you a piece of paper I made. I want you to describe for the listeners what this is. I'll give you a minute to look at it while I discuss. Uh, so you made a piece of paper. Well, I didn't make the paper. I got the paper at the store. I drew things on the paper. Okay, so Kyle got a piece of paper and That's wrote right. on it. This image, we'll take a picture of this and we'll put it in the show notes. I'm going to make it the album art. So depending on your podcast software, you can uh, maybe see it in your app. Or if not, go to dataskeptic.com and look at the show notes for this episode there. Looks like Kyle made up his own language. Some symbols are squares and dots, lines, diamonds. One's a bird, which I assume is influenced by Yoshi. Uh huh. Some are swirls. That's right. it. You pointed to one. You said one looks like a bird. Do you see that symbol repeated anywhere? Yes. The Yoshi symbol appears twice. Well, how do you know it's the same symbol? Are they precisely the same thing? No, they're not precisely the same thing. But I've watched enough series of Ghost Rider to know this is an encrypted message. <laughs> That's Ghost Rider. <laughs> I already told you about Ghost Rider. It's some show on PBS back in the, I assume it's the oh, 90s. Oh, I think it was, they had like a magic pen or something? Yeah, there was some kind of like ghost that would try to reveal things to them and like show them things and they'd try to crack codes they would have like a letter and they'd be like we have to figure out what it means and they would talk through how they figure it out i'm definitely down to watch this with you by the way i don't know if i want to see it again but as a kid it was great <laughs> the code is not so important as the symbols let's get back to you said there are two that are yoshi you know they aren't precisely the same maybe they have different meanings so there are 64 symbols on that page you counted them yeah but how many are distinct well, that's what I'm asking you know. Out of these 64 symbols, yeah, you tell me how many are distinct. Maybe you could talk through what I'm doing while I'm working. So Linda is going through and it looks like she's annotating when she thinks a symbol is first used. And then she's looking back as she scans the 64 symbols to try and say, have I seen this one before or not? And then she's numbering the ones she considers unique. Looks like there are 19 distinct symbols here. Tell me a little bit about your process because... I noticed that the second symbol there, that's kind of a diamond, you labeled that as a two. And then later on, there's another diamond shape and you labeled that as distinct. Well, what about this, this other diamond here? You Well, also that labeled. one's a fat one. So I think that one's different. Well, isn't this one a tall one? Well, I assume these two are the same and that you were just not consistent. Or maybe I was consistent. Maybe there's three styles of diamonds. There could be, but it's hard to say. What's kind of astounding here is that with only 64 examples... You were able to label 19 classes. For all the machine learning people listening, the idea that I could give someone 64 observations and they could identify 20 different classes, that's outrageous. You can't even identify a binary class very well with only 64 observations. It's too small of data for machine learning. What's a binary class? Binary class would be like true and false or zero and one. You can't identify it well, with 64 examples? I mean, I guess it depends. Like, if it's very obvious what you're studying and the features well separate the data, then probably you could. But generally, you don't need machine learning. If in 64 examples, the answer is so obvious, you probably solved it with a very just trivial rule-based approach. So then what's that called? Like rule-based systems or expert systems or something like that. Is that a common way? It had been. That was the way of the 90s and, and earlier. Is but that the way we think? Well, that's a good question. Let's get into what we think. We don't know exactly what we think. We know that a lot of artificial intelligence type algorithms, things like deep learning, are trying to do some of the same tasks that the human brain does. Doesn't mean they do them the same way, but that's where we want to go, right? The brain does some pretty impressive things. We would like our machines to do similar impressive things. I claim that this is a very impressive task that with just only 64 examples, you were able to identify 20 different classes. Some of them didn't even repeat, right? Some of these are unique symbols. Well, that's the same with our letters. We got a B and a P. They're similar, but they've just been rotated, but we consider them different letters. Right. So you have some ability to really distinctly separate all these out. If I had given this to like a random forest algorithm, it, it couldn't even approach this problem. It couldn't identify these unique symbols. And even deep learning, which we know is very good at symbol identification, for example, the MNIST data set, it's a data set of all these handwritten digits. 
it's very good at identifying like, oh, that's a zero and that's a one, so on and so forth, despite the wide variety of ways human beings will write their digits, even sloppy sometimes it gets them right. And when you look at the ones that, you know, the cutting edge versions of, of digit recognition, when they make a mistake, the mistake is usually because it's a very ambiguous letter. It's like a, a seven that's a little crooked and could be considered a one, you know, something like that. If they have difficulty recognizing a, a number or a letter, can they mark that? Does it know its ability is difficult? Mm, there's nothing prohibiting you from doing that. Uh, that's certainly possible. Yeah, I guess if you could tie in a probability, so you would do the class label and a probability of correct, then you could report both of those. That would be an interesting thing to do. Because, I mean, it's better to narrow it down so a human can then follow up and be like, oh, what... What areas does it need help? Well, may, yes. In, intrinsically, you're right. Although for some tasks, and I think digit recognition is one of them, the computers now outperform human experts. The computers are better at knowing what the digit was. But it must be on, not on all characteristics, on all factors. On, on a problem like digit recognition, I think so, yeah. So if a computer, for example, the post office which they have this problem. If a computer cannot recognize your handwriting, do they just send it back or do they send it to a human first? I don't know. And I've been meaning to interview someone from the post office about this. I haven't gotten around to asking them. But if anybody's working at the post office and listening, get in touch. I would love to hear about their uses of image recognition. But getting back on track to one-shot learning, I don't think I've really established what your brain is doing that's astounding yet. In that digit recognition stuff, that MNIST database is huge. You get to train those algorithms on tons and tons of examples. And if you threw in a single example of like Babylonian letter that hasn't been used in any language for a long time, and there was just one example of it, it's very unlikely those systems would learn to recognize that, that new digit because it's, it's rare. It's like an anecdote. There's just a single observation sitting there. How could you ever learn it? But somehow you looked at this and said, these are all new symbols just based on the first time you saw them. So you learned something in one shot. Listeners to Data Skeptic come from a wide variety of different backgrounds. Now, if you want to do anything with data, you're going to need to know a little bit of computer science. And if you weren't a computer science student and you need to fill in the gaps, I want to recommend a place I think will help you do that very easily. Brilliant.org. Brilliant has a ton of great content, and their computer science section specifically is going to give you the foundations you need to master data structures and algorithms. If you're not already comfortable with stacks, queues, binary trees, and heaps, there's no time to waste. Those are the fundamentals, and you're going to need them. Brilliant is fun and instructive. When you finish up with the computer science part, if you choose to start there, you'll discover lots of other great areas like probability, logic, complex algebra, physics, and many more. Brilliant is a much more engaging way to learn than any textbook you're going to pick up. It teaches you in very bite-sized chunks that fit a busy person's life very well, like myself, and it remembers exactly where you are. So it doesn't matter if you go back to it on your phone or your desktop, just log in. It knows all of your history, so you can pick right up learning where you stopped learning before. Check them out at brilliant.org slash data skeptic to see the many courses they offer and find the one that's right for you. Once again, that's brilliant.org slash data skeptic. But somehow you looked at this and said, these are all new symbols just based on the first time you saw them. So you learned something in one shot. And the first time you saw it, you said, aha, this is new. That's a pretty astounding thing you did. Do you have any idea how your brain made that possible? No. Well, the basic idea, I think, is that you compared it to the ones you'd seen before, and you said, do I think this is similar, or I guess, do I think this is sufficiently different from all the previous things I've seen? And when something's sufficiently different, you can maybe label that a new idea. A new idea. So that's the basic premise of what we call one-shot learning. And there's lots of approaches to this. I don't know that we can talk specifically about many algorithms, because I, I think there's a lot of open work and a lot of good papers coming out that take different approaches. I've been looking at neural Turing machines and memory augmented stuff. The use case I've actually been toying with in one commercial project is what's called active one-shot learning. Active one-shot learning is a form of reinforcement learning. Now, we haven't covered reinforcement learning on the show. We'll get to that as a mini episode. If you don't know what it is, that's okay. I think you can hear this next part without that. But the basic idea is I set the problem up with a limited number of training examples. Let's just say that this was for spam detection. You can uh, put it this way. You can say, you can set the machine up and tell it you have three choices. You can label it spam, you can label it not spam, or you can ask for help. 
All right. Imagine if that was your salary structure. What would you be doing? How often would you want to uh, get my help? Only if I thought whatever you're going to help me with would then help me get the next 10 answers right. Aha, uh-huh, yeah, that's a clever way to look at it. That's the basic idea of reinforcement learning at work then. We've set the problem up and we've asked the algorithm to figure out how can you make the most points in this game? So how can you label the most things correctly, but also on certain cases, ask for help, but get help that's going to be useful for you. So this is, uh, I think, a very novel and practical use case for one-shot learning. And in this case, it's called active one-shot learning with reinforcement learning. It's where the system has to not so much learn just what is in a given class or not, you know, like spam or not spam, but also it has to learn under what conditions should I ask for help. And hopefully it asks for help only when it's something like very unusual, it's never seen before. But the basic premise of one-shot learning is it stems out of the fact that machine learning researchers observed one limitation of machine learning. Even though it's done all these great things and become really powerful and solve a lot of problems, it requires massive amounts of training data, and it doesn't work very well when you have a really small minority class. A minority Is that class. what this is? Uh, essentially, yeah. This part isn't a direct analog to my little symbols, but... Imagine if like, you know, you were trying to classify a rare disease, like a really rare disease, something like one in 10 million people get. Well, you can have a lot of healthy people in your training data who don't have that disease. That's easy to come by. But to get data about the actual sick people is hard because there are very few of them. So the machine learning algorithm, when you ask it to solve the problem, you know, how can you best identify who has this disease or not? The solution it's probably going to come at is to say, I'm just going to guess nobody has the disease. I'm going to be right 99.999% of the time. And anytime I try and guess someone has the disease, I'm usually going to be wrong. And I'd rather have a high accuracy than be wrong ever. So to some degree, maybe we tune our algorithms. We use the F1 score, which we covered in a previous mini episode and stuff like that to try and, you know, encourage it or uh, resample or do all these different techniques to try and get the algorithm to rely more on that minority class, that small number of people who have the disease. But maybe that's just a fundamental limitation of the way we've been looking at at machine learning. Maybe instead we need to augment our algorithms and to say, try and recognize when something is new and pay extra special attention to it rather than treating all examples as being more or less created equal. So for the human brain, as yours just did, to look at all these symbols and be like, oh, these ones are are unique, You've only seen a, you know, two or three examples of them, but already on the second example, you can say, ah, the, the third symbol is the same as the second symbol. That's pretty amazing that our brains do that. And one-shot learning is trying to get machine learning to do the same process. What do you think is it that distinguishes the human brain from the machine learning algorithm? Well, what do you mean exactly? Why can't they do it? Because we haven't written the right algorithms yet. Oh, so it's a limitation on humans. You're putting it back on humans. Of course it's our fault. So if your algorithm isn't doing this, what do you suggest they do? More research on algorithms. Keep funding all all these research labs that are studying things like one-shot learning. So they need to study one-shot learning more. Well, I don't know if I want to get involved in allocation of funding because, you know, funding something more means funding something else less. But this is a very fruitful and active area of the literature that I'm looking forward to reading much more papers on. Hopefully at NIPS this year, I'll see some one-shot learning stuff come out. So can you summarize what is one-shot learning now? One-shot learning is a class of algorithms that try and allow machine learning to recognize when something new has shown up and treat it a little bit special. Learn something from a very small number of examples. And how is that different from an outlier? Oh, good question. So an outlier is something that is not representative of the data. For example, like maybe if you were looking at emissions test data for cars, and one car somehow had like uh, the, like emissions that were ridiculously off the charts, like it was the worst car that was ever observed by like a thousand. That's probably machine failure. You know, I don't know how one single car would be so bad. You know, if you told me it was like two standard deviations away, oh, sure. But if you're like, this one is 10 standard deviations away from the mean, that's so ridiculous, I'm not sure if the data is correct. But how does your program know that it's an outlier versus something very important? 
Well, that's a great question. I don't know that we can resolve that in this mini episode. I guess I would say you have to know something about the data generating process. If it's machine telemetry data that you're looking at, and you know there's a bunch of sensors and stuff, sensors can break down. So if you know the rate at which sensors break down, you should also know the rate at which outliers will appear. So you're saying this is a human now. You expect the human to solve this. Mm, Yes and no. So you ask a very good question I didn't think of. What's the difference between an outlier and a good use case for one-shot learning? I don't want to put it on the human to recognize it, but the creator of the system, the engineer, the data scientist who decides how to process data, they will have to decide, should we have any filtering in place for outliers? And they should put filtering in place if they can pretty deterministically find an actual legitimate outlier. Like, oh, this is a machine failure. This data is not correct. But if the data is correct or seems to be correct, then it's like a case for one-shot learning because you're like, this is just very unusual. What does this observation mean and what can we learn from it? Rather than treating it like, oh, we'll just not learn from this one case because we can still get a high accuracy by ignoring it. We'll look at the more common use cases, recognizing that something is a little bit special and rare and seeing if we can learn uniquely about that case. From what I heard, sounds like you're depending on the human. (laughs) Well, I'm depending on the human to develop the techniques and methodologies to provide to the machine learning algorithms such that they can execute tasks like this. Yes. Yes, but it's a human problem first. For now, yeah. Yeah. What are you driving at? I'm just saying, I was just asking whose responsibility is it to fix it? Is it the machines or is it the humans? And you just told me it's the humans, so. Well, that is your interpretation. This has gotten quite (laughs) philosophical quite quickly. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> if you have an opinion on this, why don't you go to the comment section and tell us what you think. <laughs> All right, Linda. Well, thank you as always for joining me. We didn't get into the algorithmic sides of one-shot learning. I may save that and do a follow-up episode, primarily because I think there are a couple fruitful approaches, and I name-dropped a few of those. But maybe we can go into deeper episodes in the future on things like active one-shot learning and neural Turing machines. But the basic class of one-shot learning is what I wanted to kind of cover today. So thanks as always for joining me, Linda. Thank you, Kyle. And until next time, please keep thinking skeptically of and with data. Good night. Good night. Data Skeptic is a listener-supported program. To support the show, visit dataskeptic.com and click on the membership tab. 